So finally, on to framework synthesis. Um, some of you will have experience of this before. Um, you've given me a little bit of indication who has um, used framework synthesis before. So it's got five stages. So um, you've done your search on your topic. You've got your framework synthesis question. Um, you've done your search and you've sort of got to the stage where you've got your included studies in front of you. And again, we could do a whole webinar on those stages alone. So I'm assuming that you've got your um, sample of studies in front of you. And the five stages are as follows. So you familiarize yourself with the included studies. And that basically means that you've got to read them and reread them and understand them those studies, you familiarize themselves. The next stage is to identify or to develop a thematic framework. So hence, it's called framework synthesis. And you can either do that by actually using the question and using the policies that, that inform that question, and by reading and rereading the first few studies to create a framework of things that you're particularly interested in at looking at. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Or you can use a, a, a framework such as a, an existing theory. And I'm going to show you some examples of those in a minute. So you then index, and that means that you apply the framework to code the individual studies. So you either extract information in the, in the primary studies that can be mapped against the, the um, elements in your framework or your elements in your of codes that you're looking at, and I'll show you. So you do that on an individual study basis. So you apply the framework to your study. You extract all the information out, all the findings out that help you address those particular areas. And then from that, you distill, you start adding one study to another. So all the information around one code across the studies you'd actually um, pool together to get a, a, a sort of an overarching picture. And then you'd start developing themes around the findings that around the particular things that you're looking at. And from that, you, you create charts which contain distilled summaries of the evidence. And then the charts are used to help define the concepts and the nature of the phenomena to create ty uh, typologies and the associations between themes as a way of developing explanations. So that all sounds quite a lot, um, but the best way is to, I think, look at some examples. So this is an example of a framework that was used in um, a National Institute for um, Health and Clinical Excellence um, guideline production, which was around tobacco harm reduction. So this was a framework that was created around existing policies um, around tobacco harm reduction, particular things of interest that we were looking at. So you'll see here um, that we were looking at the type of intervention we coded for that, um, the selection method, whether it was self-initiated, whose voice was speaking, we coded for that. Um, we coded for whether um, reduction was successful, whether they're a quitter, whether they're unsuccessful. So we had the question in mind and we linked this with an intervention review. So we were already aware of all the things that we wanted to look for. We wanted to look particularly for equity issues um, in young people, whether they were disadvantaged, um, whether they were adult, etc. So we coded for all of that. And then we created a framework of codes of which included themes and sub sub themes. And these included things like the perceived barriers and facilitators against smoking, um, smokers in homes and environment. And we extracted the evidence out on that. We were particularly looking to populate um, evidence against social barriers, social facilitators, physical barriers, phys physical facilitators and so on. So this is this is part of the framework. Um, it goes on, uh, but you sort of get the idea. This is we created this particularly for this this particular systematic review um, that we against which we extracted the evidence to build up a big picture across the studies as to what was successful with tobacco harm reduction interventions. So that's one example where you make the framework for your particular review. Another example is where you use an existing framework. So um, this is from a Cochrane review. Um, it's the Lay Health Worker Review, and it used the SURE framework. Now, I have no idea what SURE stands for, but it's a theory-informed framework that looks at the factors, implementation factors, and when implementing a new policy. So you'll see here it's, it's, it's um, quite intuitive. It's on different levels. 
So it starts off with the recipients of care and the factors that affect um, implementation are the knowledge and skills, their attitudes towards program acceptability, their motivation to change or adopt a new behavior and so on. So we then took these particular things and we mapped those against the primary studies that were included in the review and we extracted out all the information that would help us address these issues and understand them. Um, we had to adapt this framework a little bit because we found out that it was a bit too constrained and that's one of the things about framework synthesis is that your framework can be too constraining um, and you might have to adapt it just a little bit. So there's an example of um, the SURE framework. This is another example um, for those of you who like theory. This is a framework that uses something called normalization process theory, which is a, another implement, implementation theory, which is about staff behaviors, professional behaviors in implementing an intervention. So again, um, it's got all the particular factors around staff and implementation here. Um, and then again, the evidence is picked out from the individual studies to um, populate it. So again, a different type of um, theory. Um, and again, go back to our guidance on how to pick a theory to make sure that you've, you've got the most appropriate one. So there are several examples of framework synthesis in the Cochrane Library that you can have a look at. Here's, here's just one of them, and um, I suggest you go and, down, go and download it. And um, this is the barriers and facilitators to the implementation of lay health workers uh, programs to improve access to maternal and child health. And that used the SURE framework. So I'm just going to ask you here to use the, you, your, your chat. Um, can you share any, any of your thoughts on framework synthesis? I mean, would you use it? Have you used it? What do you think of it? Um, I think from my perspective, it's, it's a really good first step. Um, it's probably one of the most common forms of uh, synthesis. It allows you to get started. But that the choice of the framework is the most important thing. It can be too constraining. Um, and in moving on to look at thematic synthesis and specifically the um, thematic synthesis approach developed by Thomas and Harden, they developed this approach because they first tried a, th a framework synthesis and they found it too constraining, so they ditched it. And they came up with this new approach, which is a three-stage thematic synthesis approach, which includes, and many of you who are primary qualitative researchers will understand this, it's very much like a primary uh, method of qualitative analysis. You do line-by-line -line coding of the um, primary study the development of descriptive themes, so it's all inductive. You don't start off with any preconceived ideas or any preconceived um, framework, as in the previous approach. Um, and you develop analytical themes. Now, analytical themes are the, is, is moving up to the third level, where you're um, hoping to develop new theory or new theoretical insights. The descriptive themes are describing what's in the primary studies. So there's a lovely paper that um, James and Angela produced on how to do this. You, this is around um, children's healthy eating, a qualitative evidence synthesis. You can see that they've uploaded the whole of the primary study into a software product, and there are lots of software products that you could use to do qualitative evidence synthesis. And here they are doing their uh, stage one line by line coding. And you can see that what they're looking for here is children's um, children's data around talking about healthy eating. And they've coded um, everything in the primary studies that is around children talking about healthy eating. And it purely is just coding like that, free coding, uh, creating codes um, that best describe. So you can see in yellow here, they've coded that bad food, nice, good food, awful. Um, they've coded it under the perceptions of health benefits and they created this typology of codes that, that actually best helps them understand the data at descriptive level. They then do um, carry on with their inductive coding and they can create up um, and develop descriptive themes which describes um, the sort of totality of what the primary studies are saying. And then level three, they can move up above that and they can do their translation and, tra and move to transformation of the data and, and do their interpretation of what's going on that's not necessarily um, reported in the primary studies, but they can hypothesize and develop new theory as to what is going on. And you can see on the right hand side of your slide that they've come up with four, oh, sorry, three recommendations 
out of that, which is a new interpretation of the primary studies. And you can find the whole reference to this here, um, uh, just to have a look at how they've done it. And the original reference to the review is in the Epicentre Library, which is free to download. So again, share your chat with me on um, your thoughts on Thomas and Harden's um, thematic synthesis. What do you think of it? Could you use it? Um, does it seem slightly more difficult than framework synthesis? Do you need more skills to do it? I would probably say yes. Um, I think that if you're a novice person, never done it before, then you do need experience in qualitative research. You need that experience of data handling because there's a vast amount of data here for you to make sense of. So you do need some training and experience of qualitative research to make sense of this. Otherwise, you can get lost in the data. So I'm going to move on finally to metaethnography. Um, metaethnography is probably the most complex of qualitative evidence synthesis um, approaches and you really do need to have an experienced team doing this. So there is a really nice book on how to do it um, but we've moved on quite a lot from the um, basic descriptions in the 1988 book by Noblet and Hare but as I said before metaethnography is specifically for developing new theory on something and new theoretical insights. Um, and you'll see here, I've put in the quote, it's making a hole into something more than the sum of the parts alone imply. So you are, you do need to be very um, interpretive. You need a plastic brain and you need to be very creative, but your creation and your, your the way that you develop theory needs to be embedded in the evidence, all right? And one of the criticisms of metaethnography is people that can go a bit too far when developing new theory. So I said it's more complicated. There are seven stages, getting started, deciding what's relevant to the, um, to the initial interest, reading the studies, determining how the studies are related, translating the studies into one other, synthesizing the translations, and this is where you start transforming the data and then expressing the synthesis. So I'm gonna look at those one by one. So you start off by doing what they call a reciprocal translation, when you look at all the concepts in the primary studies and see what is similar, and I'll show you how to do that. You then go back and look at the studies and say, well, does anything not fit that pattern? Is there an alternative explanation? And that's what they call a refutational translation. And sorry for those of you who, for whom English isn't your first language. These are big words to deal with, but I'll try and um, give a, uh, an explanation of what it means. And then once you've done those first two stages, you would do a line of argument synthesis, which is very much like the thematic synthesis that we've just seen. But it's going, uh, again, it's translational, it's going up to the theory level, the development of theory level. So let's look at what the reciprocal translation looks like. So you're looking at the individual studies to see um, what they're saying and what they're reporting and whether there are similarities across the different studies. So you can see here in study one, there's concept X. There's also concept X is reported in study two, but concept X is not reported in study three. There are new concepts there, Y and Z. So you're looking to see um, how the, the concepts translate across studies. So you actually find a way of organizing all your, your studies and just starting off with one, seeing what's in it. Then you look at the next study, seeing how that maps on to see whether there are new um, concepts, whether those concepts are, are similar in other studies. So you go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards until you've done your reciprocal translation and you've mapped all the findings across all the studies and to see how they fit and relate together. You then go back and do the refutational translation, and this is looking for evidence that doesn't fit um, to the, the, the evidence that's translated across. And so, for example, in study one, you might find that chronic pain is life changing, whereas in study two, you might find that chronic pain is not life changing. Or in, and in study three, it might say that chronic pain is imagined. So all of these um, are at odds in terms of findings. So you also have to map that as well. For those of you who are quali qualitative researchers, primary qualitative researchers, you might know that as your disconfirming case, where you look for alternative explanations when you're looking at primary um, qualitative data analysis. Then your line of argument synthesis. Um, you want to create a, a line of argument or a finding 
that translates and transforms across those studies. So it might be getting diagnosed, getting um, treated, and then so on and so on. So you create a coherent story that creates a finding that translates across the studies, and then you present it. So we've talked about here about the, um, the first, second, and third level um, constructs, and that's really important for metaethnography. Um, so the research participants' experiences are the first order, the researcher interpretations are the second order. In metaethnography, you definitely want to get to the third order, which is the new interpretations. This is what this, this methodology is designed for. So I'm going to whiz through um, one example, which is a very classic example, is using research about lay meanings. And lay meanings are, are um, patients' meanings, people who aren't experts or professionals. So lay meanings of medicines is one example. And the research question for this meta-ethnography were how do the perceived meanings of medicines affect patients' medicine-taking behavior and communication with healthcare professionals? So starting off, deciding what's relevant, you do your searches, and there's a lot of them. You have to um, select the qualitative studies that you think are relevant. And you can purposefully sample. Um, in quantitative reviews, the, the, the sort of convention is to include everything. With a meta-ethnography, you couldn't possibly do that. So it is possible to select the studies. And again, the concepts from the individual studies are then translated. Once you've read them, you get an idea of what's similar and different between the studies. Um, and then you look at how the studies are related to, to each other. And in this particular example, the common concepts across the studies were these. Um, so there was adherence and compliance, self-regulation, aversion, alternative coping strategies, the sanctions, and the selective disclosure were seen across some but not all of the studies. So that's how that they worked out when they were translated and you looked at how they were related. And then thinking about telling that coherent story, the new interpretations from those concepts that I've just inserted on the right-hand side, and then how they related to those new interpretations are shown with the arrows. So you build up this new interpretation by reconfiguring the evidence and having a better understanding of it by putting all the studies together. Now, of course, in many of these qualitative evidence syntheses, you have an expert group. Um, you take your findings to the expert group. The expert group would include your patients, you know, your consumers, etc. So you would need a big review team to do this, and you would need to make sure that you'd got all the resources in place. So these reviews are expensive. And then this is the final sort of phase, leaping ahead. This is their final theory um, that they came up as to why people do or don't take their medicines. They came up with a new theory as to why people reject their medicines, take their medicines as prescribed, or become passive acceptors of medicine without question. All informed by the evidence, but it was a completely new interpretation that if you took any one of the individual papers that contributed to the synthesis, you wouldn't find that there. So I've got a couple of examples. Um, this is um, of a meta-ethnography. So this is one that was done as part of a Cochrane and WHO guideline, What Matters to Women. It's called a systematic scoping review, but actually it's a meta-ethnography. Um, and it was designed to determine um, what women, um, what mattered to women about their antenatal experience. And the sorts of evidence that, that it came up with included their values, the acceptability, equity, feasibility, and something around personal accounts around the benefits and harms to supplement the quantitative data. So there's a reference for you to have a look at it there. There's also a protocol in the Cochrane Library, which is a meta-ethnography, which is the corresponding qualitative evidence synthesis which is factors that influence the uptake of routine antenatal services um, by pregnant women, a qualitative evidence synthesis. And that is a meta-ethnography as well. And it's a really nicely um, described protocol. So have a look. So again, use your chat to share your thoughts on meta-ethnography. My feeling is, and my experience is, it's much more complicated. You do need experience of doing it. You can get lost. Um, you do need um, an expert group that you can actually um, go back to and present your findings to. Um, and they, do, they are time consuming. So you do need to take these things into consideration. <laughs>